I have two books at my bedside, Lieutenant. The Marine Corps Code of Conduct and the King James Bible. I hate snakes, Shock! I hate them! And may the Christian Lord guide my hand against your Roman popery! And they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! We're on a mission from God. Entitled you want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Maybe we should chug on over to Mamby Pamby land where maybe we can find some self-confidence for you, you jackwagon! Coming to you live from his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is the talk show that apparently Hell Hates today. And uh, the more that I go on, the more I understand why. I, you'll have to forgive me today. Um, I have a, a very sour stomach today. Uh, I don't know what's up with that. I don't like it. Um, and I got a buzz in my microphone. Bzzz, there it is. Uh, but anyway, good to be with you today. I got a couple of things I want to share with you. Uh, excuse me. <clears throat> Let me take a little sip here. Bicarbonate of soda, otherwise known as Diet Mountain Dew. Um, I've I've been I'm, I'm doing a uh, the research on a new Watchmen series. Now, it will not be out tomorrow, so forgive me. If it, uh, and by the way, I uploaded part one of our um, homecoming series. Uh, let me check on Sermon Audio and see if it's there. Let's see here. Sermon audio. Sermon audio. If I can get rid of that stupid buzz, that might help a lot. Um, anyway, let's see here. King James Code, After Stories, Light of the World, God the Righteous Judge. Let's see here. Is that it? No, that's not it. Um, anyway, I I uploaded. Um, let me try this one. SermonAudio.com slash Bethel. Live broadcast. Ask your servant's children. Let your light shine. The, the word of God. Sweet. Yeah. No. That's not it either. Yeah, it has to be. Yeah, that's part one of our of our um, homecoming um, is the Word of God. What is it called? The Word of God, sweet and bitter. Now, that would be Sunday school. Anyway, I'll try to figure it out. But uh, even YouTube had a problem, and I'm not in YouTube jail anymore. Um, so I don't know what's going on with all of our uploads and everything like that, but I'll try to get it figured out and get it fixed for all of you uh, as soon as I can. Uh, what was I going to say now? Um, I'm doing the research on how we got um, our English Bible and why is it that there is a lie going around, 
It's been spread for years. It is a lie that at one time I believed this lie. And I just, when I look back at it, I, I just go, you know, Hoggard, you broke rules. You, you were supposed to research this. You just accepted it the way it is. Um, but it's, it's going to be on how we got our Bible into English and what impact that has had on the world. And I'll tell you, um, there are things that are in the Bible that have gone back way before 1611 uh, that has impacted um, English speaking around the world for hundreds of years. There are elements of our language, things that we say, things that we speak, um, things that we say, that the meaning is different, and so on, um, that has been part now of English vocabulary. Even if you're not a Christian, you say these things. I mentioned the other day the phrase once and for all. That is... That phrase, uh, let's see here. Let me type that in. Once and for, no, that's not it. Once for all. Yep. Hebrews 10.10. Let me put that up on the screen for you. Uh, so we don't reverberate here. There we go. It's this phrase, uh, Hebrews 10:10, 10, 10, by the which we, uh, by the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, theologically, that tells us that Christ died one time for everybody. This is probably why. Excuse me. John Wycliffe was so hated by the Catholic Church that 44 years after his death, they had a trial on him, accused him of heresy, dug his body up, burnt what was left of it, scattered the ashes into the river, so that he has no resting place. As if that's going to keep God from resurrecting him. As if God's going to go, where's Wycliffe? I don't, I can't resurrect him. I can't find him. We've lost Wycliffe, angels. Come on, snap out of it. I know there's more of you than can be numbered. I want you to find every little molecule of John Wycliffe, so we can resurrect him. I, I don't. It's not going to happen that way. Um, I'm like Paul. You can get my body to be burned. I don't care. That does not stop God's resurrection plan. It does not stop. In fact, to me, it testifies. It testifies of of the greater power of God, God's ability to um, resurrect me even when there's no physical body left. It all turns to dust, doesn't it? So anyway, uh, I was looking at that the other day. And then I have, so far in my collection, I have a copy of the Geneva Bible. I have a copy of John Wycliffe's Bible which I will tell you is difficult to read uh, because John Wycliffe was writing um, in what is referred to as early English, okay? And um, there, there are some words that you can make out, some you can figure out, so it's kind of like every now and then you've got a marker 
that kind of tells you where you're at, okay? And then you try to figure out the rest of it. You try to guess on the rest of it, okay? Uh, then I have um, William Tyndale's uh, 1526 New Testament. And I don't, I don't know if I mentioned this or not. The, the Greek Septuagint. Septuagint, that word simply means the 70. And if you remember what I mentioned about it is that um, this, this book, it's a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. Um, now, don't worry about me. I'm not going all off on Greek and Hebrew and how you got to know Greek and Hebrew you know, if, if you're going to know what the Bible means. That's not, I don't know enough about Greek or Hebrew for that matter uh, to be able to, to even come close to being able to do that. I don't have, I don't have the uh, interest in doing it. Uh, I know God's not leading me to do it, but it helps when I've got a I've got a book here. This is the Septuagint, okay? And it predates Christ by about 300 years. So what the what the 70 Jewish scholars and scribes did was they took the uh, the Hebrew Old Testament and they translated it into Greek because this is what I this is what I could gather uh, could be wrong been wrong before I will be wrong again uh, but what I could gather is that um, the, these rabbis figured that the Jews were starting to be Hellenized, okay? Now, that's, <laughs> no, it doesn't have anything to do with hell, okay? Uh, the word Hel Helena uh, is the Greek word for Greek, okay? Uh, if you ask a Greek, where, is he, where, are, you, where are you from? Hel Helena, okay? That, that means Greek to them. So anyway, they, they realized that a lot of the Jews, although they were not very good at reading and speaking Hebrew, they were much better because this was what they lived under. They were much better at speaking and reading and understanding Greek. So these men got together and they worked on a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, uh, like I said, it predates Christ by about 300 years. Now, there's been some questions in my mind um, about, uh, let me go to Luke chapter 4. If you have a Bible on you, go to Luke chapter 4, uh, or you could just look at the screen, but uh, i like for you to have a Bible, that way you can make notes, okay? Because I'm going to give you a theory today. Oh, my goodness. Pray for me today. I'm going to give you a theory uh, concerning uh, something that occurs in Luke chapter 4 that, according to the rules of the Bible, shouldn't be there. Okay? Now, I'm not saying the Bible made a mistake. Not by far am I saying that. Uh, I'm going to th throw at you a, uh, just a, a theory of mine. So I've got my King James up here. I've got my um, Tyndale 15, 1526 Bible. Uh, English translation of the Bible. I got to find chapter four. That's one thing that's a little difficult 
about these older Bibles is that they used a script that, that is uh, more Germanic than it is uh, anything else. And it's just a little bit hard to read. Is that, uh, let's see, that's V-I, that's six. Let's see here. That's V. So we are in, we should be in I-V. Yes, the I-V chapter. Uh, of course, you. this is where the devil tempts Christ and so on. And I want you to look up on the screen. Um, in verse 16, the Bible says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And where, uh, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. Now, number one, we're pretty sure, or at least I am, pretty sure that Jesus is reading the book of Isaiah in Hebrew, okay? That's generally, even to this day, the Jews will read, Jewish rabbis will read from the Torah scroll, and they will read it in Hebrew. So, Let's just let's just make that assumption. Um, verse seventeen, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. When he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Now, the place where it was written is Isaiah sixty-one. Okay, we're going to go there in a minute. Jesus begins to read. Verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he stopped mid-sentence. He stopped mid-sentence. Notice that to preach the acceptable year of the Lord is the last thing that Jesus said. So now, let's go to Isaiah. Uh, 61, Isaiah 61, right there. Okay, and he's, and this is how it starts. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That sentence is not done. Right here, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord is where Jesus closed the book. He stopped reading right here. And where it, where it finishes and says, And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Um, he didn't read that part. Why didn't he read that part? My belief is, is after Jesus reads this, let's go back to Luke chapter 4. After he reads this, um, he closed the book, he gave it again to the minister and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. This scripture. 
not anything after this scripture, but this scripture right here, this day is fulfilled in your ears. Amen. Now, here's our problem. Um, I'm going to go back to Isaiah 61. And um, let's see here. Where is it? There you are hiding from me right there. Isaiah 61. So I'm going to read this from the uh, from the 1526 uh, Tyndale New Testament. Uh, if I can find it, let's see here. Um, that's Herod the Tetrarch. We don't care about Herod the Tetrarch, do we? Gospel, St. Luke. Am I in the right place? No, I lost my place somehow. In chapter 8. Luke. Chapter 4. There we go. All right. So I'm going to read from the, uh, the Tyndale version. And by the way... You might want to read from the King James while I'm reading from the Tyndale because uh, one of the things that I found out is that 80% of the Tyndale Bible ended up in the King James. So you're, you're going to have a very, very close reading of the Bible between uh, the time of Tyndale to the time of King James. Um, so there, there, there are no verse markings here, so I'm going to do the best I can to find out. There was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to cause, uh, or because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me um, to heal them which are troubled. Let's see here, make sure I'm reading that right. To preach the gospel to the poor. Uh, he has sent me, and to heal them which are troubled in their something. I can't read that. I can't make that word out. Uh, to preach deliverance to the captives and uh, to give... Uh, sight to the blind and let's see here and and freely to set at liberty those that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord and he closed the book okay now um I've known this for a while, that there, there is a difference between what Jesus reads in Isaiah 61 and, um, you know what, let me, let me see if I can do this. Uh, we might get to that in a little bit. Hang on a second. Find another King James Pure Bible Search software. We'll do a we'll do a side by side comparison. There is an addition there. Um, 
that for a long time, I didn't really know why uh, there, there, that there was something added to the text. Was it added by uh, Isaiah? No, I don't believe that. Was it uh, added by Luke? Uh, no, I don't believe that either. Let's see if we can get another version going here. There we go. So I'm going to put I'm going to put Isaiah's rendering of this here. What what Isaiah actually wrote. And we'll do a side-by-side -side between that. Yeah, I made, did the wrong thing. Here we go. There we go. And we'll do make this one the Mark one. Or excuse me, the Luke chapter 4. Put that on top. Put that one down. Luke chapter 4. There we go. So here is what Isaiah said, and here's what Jesus said. Isaiah said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Jesus said in, in Luke, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. We have a, little, have a little difference here, don't we? Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. Here he says, uh, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Then he says, uh, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Here in Luke, he says, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. That could be the same. To proclaim liberty to the captives. In Luke, to proclaim or to preach deliverance to the captives. Same thing, different way of saying it. And the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Um, let's see here. We don't have, let's see, the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives. To proclaim liberty to the captives. The opening of the prison to them that are bound. But we don't have that from Isaiah 61 to Luke chapter 4, we don't have that. To proclaim liberty to the captives um, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's where he stops. Then here, back in Luke chapter 4, and um, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of the sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, when I, I go to, and let me just clear all this out here. I went to the Septuagint. Now, I am not, again, I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm not a, um, a manuscript professor by any means. I believe that my King James Bible is right in everything that it says. Rule number one. There are no mistakes in the Bible. Rule number two, if you think you found a mistake, refer to rule number one. There are no mistakes in the Bible. I will believe that until the day I die. Now, 
So I found Isaiah, and what I like about this particular book is it has the Greek translation, and then next to it, this is my this is my kind of uh, Greek text. It's got the English equivalent next to it. That way you can read it in English. Because I speak as the English. Let's see, this is 10 before L, so that's uh, so that's 40, right? And then L is 50. L-I-X is licks. <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> Whoa, them drums are loud, aren't they? Let's see how loud they are. Yeah, I turned them down a little bit. So if I have um, L, I need LXI, LX and LXI. That would be that would be Isaiah sixty-one, wouldn't it? Okay. Um, all right, I'm going to read how the Septuagint. Now this would be. This would be um, how the, the, the Jewish scribes, 300 years before Christ, stood up in that uh, synagogue and read, um, read that passage of Scripture. And he said, this is, this is fulfilled right here, right now. This day is this Scripture fulfilled in your ears. And so everybody's going... Did he say that? I don't know if he said, did he, was he talking about himself? I didn't. Everybody's mumbling amongst themselves. So here it says, let's see here. Numa Kuryu, Spirit of the Lord. Oh, and I got something else too. Just, just occurred to me. I can't. Oh, I got to show you this. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me. He has sent me to preach glad tidings to the poor, and I like that. Glad tidings. The Greek word for that is euangelion. Euangelion has the word angel enion in it. You say big deal. It has the word angelos, angel. Okay? An angel simply is a messenger. So the word we use evangelist is they are the angels of the gospel. These these men that we send forth to preach the word of God for revival meetings, to preach to lost people wherever they are. Um, these men that go all over the country, all over the world, God bless them. Um, but that's who they are. They are they are evangelists. They have the word angel in their in their title, Evangelion. Um, and so anyway, he has sent me to preach glad tidings, and that's what it means. Remember what was said of the angels that uh, met the shepherds. Behold, we bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. The good tidings is the literal interpretation of the word uh, euangelion, evangel, um, or evangelistic. Uh, or the word gospel. It means good tidings. Good tidings, literally. Uh, I have not found uh, any place where it says that the gospel simply is the good news. Um, and that, that may be splitting hairs. It may be, I don't know. It's just that I kind of like to stick with what has already been written, and right now it's already been written that it's glad tidings. Uh, but anyway, he has sent me to preach glad tidings to the poor, uh, to heal the broken in heart, 
to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to declare the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of recompense. And again, that's where he cuts it off. Uh, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And even here, um, it's, it's, the sentence is divided up by a comma between the word Lord to, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, comma, and the, day of, uh, and the day of recompense to comfort all that mourn. And so anyway, um, here's my little theory on this. Who is this? Okay. My little theory on this is how, how, come, how come Jesus added something to the Bible? How come he did that? Because there's something extra added in to what he himself read from Isaiah 61. Got, a, got an answer for that? Uh, I think I do. And it's actually rather simple. Okay? Um, three times. Let me put this, let me pull this up here. Uh, I'm not going to show it on the screen, but three times, I think. What, how in the world did I spell it like that? I'm glad I didn't show you that. That would show my ignorance. There we go. Oh, okay. Three times. The Bible uses the word author. And all three times it's a reference to Christ. Number one, God is not the author of of confusion so what God authored is not confusion and it's not meant to lead us into confusion like this quote uh, that I found let me it's in the it's in the front of um, this reprint of Tyndale's Bible. Uh, let's see here if I can find it real quick. There, there was this rule that said that if you had in your house even a scrap of a verse of Scripture that was not in Latin. So like if you had made it late it ladies, if you had made a tapestry to hang in in you know in your room in your house and you had spent years on this tapestry and you decided to put at the bottom just a few words that you had heard out of the Bible like um, God is love if you put that in English and not in Latin, then the church had the right to tear that down off of the wall of your house, burn it, burn your house down, just because you had a piece of Scripture in your house in your presence, in, in amongst your effects, um, and it wasn't in Latin. It was in English. That was a crime for that. Can you imagine them trying to get away with that now? They'd have to burn down 80% of the houses in this country, one way or the other. Uh, but anyway, that that's... That's the kind of stuff they run into. Now, getting back to what Jesus did, he's the author. He's not God is not the author of confusion. Hebrews 5 says that he's the author of eternal salvation. 
And then Hebrews 12 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So I think there's zero doubt now. There is absolutely no doubt in our minds whatsoever. Those of us who are what we would, I keep referring to as Bible Christians, as opposed to any other type of Christian. A Christian that, oh, I don't know, came forward uh, at the end of a rock concert in the church and had their hands in the air and somebody led a prayer and they all waved like this and all that uh, that person now is saved and, and uh, he's going to heaven. It's automatic, okay? I'm not talking about anybody like that. I'm talking about somebody who truly believes and reads the Word of God. Um. I think Jesus, if anybody had the right to add to or take away from or change in some way the words of the Bible, it would be the author who, who could do it. It would be him. So, I look at this, and we know that that extra piece is in there. What do we decide it was? Um, Preach deliverance to the captives, recovering a sight to the blind, maybe, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Uh, One of those phrases was added as Jesus read it, in the synagogue, and then he sits down and he says, this day is this uh, this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And the people were like, wow, we're a fulfillment of Bible prophecy? Yeah, that's what you are. So anyway, just something to, to add, hopefully, a little delight to your day, um, I, I'm liking this because, number one, I, I like history. I like studying things that has happened. And um, with the Bible, not only have they already happened, but the good part is they're going to happen again. Only this time, the fireworks are going to be bigger than they were the first time, okay? It's going to be exciting and maybe a little scary, okay? But I I think overall it's going to be be good, all right? Now, um, I've been asked this question. Let's see if I, I already have it pulled up here. Uh, I've been asked this question before, and um, you know I want I I want to be nice to people um, who get pulled into different things, and I just want to say uh, if if you if you are practicing yoga, okay, yoga because it rhymes with choka, okay, <laughs> no. Uh, it, it rhymes with yoke, is what it and it literally means that you are yoking yourself to the the one of the high deities in Hinduism. His name is Brahma. Now, how you can justify that, I don't know. Okay, I mean, I just don't know. Um, if somebody invited me to go to their uh, church get together and said, "Oh, it's just going to be a bunch of games and stuff like that," uh, it's not. Even, in fact, it's not even going to be at our church. It's going to be at uh, West City Park. That's in here in this Festus. It's going to be at West City Park. Going to have a bunch of stuff out there. Uh, Won't you come on? Bring some of the grandkids. We got stuff for them. Yeah, I might do that. I get there. I find out that it's the whole thing 
is in honor of St. Mary Magdalene. And they brought her statue out. They've got paintings of St. Mary Magdalene. They got all this stuff where you can pray to St. Mary Magdalene. They give out St. Mary Magdalene medals. All of that, that have been blessed by, by the Papa, by the Pope. As soon as I find that out, I'm out. I'm not hanging around that. I'm not going to be a part of that. I don't care how much fun they have. I don't care if they have a, a, a drawing there like we did for homecoming where we gave away a, a family Bible. I don't care if they have a drawing there. and They give away a million dollars, and I would have been the guy that won it. I don't care. There's no way in the world that I'm going to something that gives honor to Mary Magdalene as if she is a mediator between men and God because that's what they believe, that she is a mediator, that you can pray to St. Mary Magdalene and she will hear your prayers. In fact... Whenever there is a papal conclave where uh, all of the cardinals are uh, in procession walking into, um, what is that? St. Peter's Basilica is the whole building. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's the one where Michelangelo has uh, God touching Adam's finger, that room. They're all marching in there and they're chanting this chant. Ora pro nobis. And then everybody sings, Mary Magdalena. And then the other, then, then the leader says, Ora pro nobis. Uh, Sancta Thomas or whatever. All right. I may have gotten it wrong, but. Ora pro nobis means pray for us. They, they go through the whole list of saints, asking all of the saints of heaven to pray for them as they go in and play politics. Yeah, like God's in that, sure. Anyway, so you're yoked. You're yoked to Brahma. When you do yoga. Now, it doesn't happen overnight, I don't think. But you know what? I wouldn't, if I did it once and I found out that it had to do with yoking myself to a false god, to a devil, I don't think I would want to do it again. Okay? I don't think I would. Now, see this graphic up on the screen here. This is about 10 years old. Microsoft will solve cancer within 10 years by reprogramming diseased cells. Chris Bishop, laboratory director at Microsoft Research, said biology and computing have very deep connections on the most fundamental level. Think about that. Think about what we were learning 10 years ago. What we were learning 10 years ago has now been implemented. It's been, it's been activated. The program has been running for quite a while now. And you have Microsoft, Google, Apple, Samsung, uh, all of these, um, Yahoo. You've got all of these major tech companies, Amazon's doing it, that are involved in reprogramming, rewriting human DNA. It was predicted. 10 years ago, and it is happening. 
today. Um, I just thought that was interesting. So 2 Corinthians 11. And what this is, is, is a false gospel. False gospel. How so, Pastor Mike? Paul said, but I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, oh, no, no, it's a lot more subtle than that, through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ, for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And it's, it's pretty simple. The idea of this gospel is, uh, let me go back to this. The whole purpose of this is to eliminate not just cancer, but all diseases. That's the goal of it. To eliminate every disease in the world. And to be able to do it freely. In other words, so that it doesn't cost anything. Now, I don't know how that's going to work with all the pharma companies who love making money off people being sick. There's that much I believe in, people. I may not, listen, I, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a physician. I'm not a medical specialist. So when you want me to sign on to uh, a lot of the, the stories that you find on the Internet that quote-unquote prove that such and such a medicine is, is the mark of the beast and anybody that takes it is going to be doomed for all of eternity. Uh, when you ask me to accept that, forgive me if I don't just dive right into that all at once. I'm not a doctor. And quite frankly, 99% of you people out there are not either. So you're just passing along something that you've heard somebody else say. It's all you're doing. Anyway, um, we're not just talking about reprogramming cancer cells. We're talking about reprogramming all kinds of cells that would block or in some other way not allow these cells that require a human host that would allow these cells to prosper uh, once they're inside the human body. Reprogram the body so that uh, these things would die once they enter the human body. Okay? I mean, that's always a possibility. And yes, I do believe that that could happen. So, uh, we have this account of another gospel, which basically says that... Um, Somebody's going to come along, according to Galatians chapter 1, and they're going to preach another gospel. Another, <laughs> what have we been talking about the last hour? Uh, another, um, another set of good tidings of great joy that they say is going to be for all people. And that if they take uh, this one 
uh, this one medication or they take this medication over the course of, let's say, six months. If they take this, then all of a sudden they're going to start feeling better. They're going to have more energy. They're going to um, certainly going to, like I said, they're going to feel better. They're just going to have their, like their old body back, back when they were in their, let's say, their early 20s. They're going to feel good, feel like they're not old people anymore. Now, you can sell that to a lot of people nowadays. There's, what is, what is the phrase? It's a shame that youth is wasted on the young. Okay. Whoa, I didn't say that word. Honest, I didn't. But it's a shame that youth is wasted on the young. You know, the older you get, the smarter you get about how the world really works. When you're young, you've, you're full of energy. You've got this bulletproof body and all of this stuff. And you can do all of these wonderful things like riding on motorbikes and things like that. But when you get older, man, you're going to break a hip for that. Okay, There's no way around it either. So the other gospel... I believe, has to do with, if we were to examine the real gospel first. Um, let's put it up on the screen here. Which one? There we go. Let's put the real gospel up here. And let's, uh, let's use 1 Corinthians 1.5. We'll start using there. It talks about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Uh, but then, where in the world am I? 16, here we go, 15. Death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And then it talks here about the resurrection. And, um, and it says here in uh, verse 37, And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body, that shall be but bare grain, it may chance of wheat or some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. So there's no doubt, there's no doubt that God is going to give us a body of Godhood. Did you catch that? I had a lady years ago and i'd never really held this against her i i tried to i tried to reason with her to get her to see what i was talking about she called one day and she said i had heard that you said that we would become gods and i said well ma'am what i said was and I quoted Psalm 82 where Jesus said, I have said ye are all gods and all of you children of the Most High. But you shall die. And I, and I quoted the rest of that. And uh, she, had, she, was, she had such a problem with that. She said, you're, you're blaspheming God. You're saying exactly what the devil said in Genesis 3. You're going around telling everybody they're going to be gods, just like Satan did. I said, ma'am, I'm quoting Scripture. Doesn't that mean any click? She hung up on me. And I'm like, man, I can't, can't win here. But the truth of it is, folks, the Bible, Jesus himself said, Number one, we're going to be like angels in heaven. We're going to have their body types, which uh, are not bound by the principles and the physics of this three-dimensional world that we live in here. Um, we will neither marry nor will we be given in marriage. Number four, we will be perfect to the to the extent that 
wherever it is that we are uh, that we are judging mankind, we cannot be offered gifts. Do you know why? There's nothing we want. And there's nothing that anybody could have for us that we would go, you know, I've been wanting that for a long time. Yeah, I'll take that. Hand it over here. I'll rule in your favor. Hand me that. That won't happen. There's not there's nothing that we'll want to eat. There's nothing that we'll want to drink. There's nothing in this world that we want to collect and say, this is this is gold. I want to get as much as this as I can. You're talking about pavement in heaven. Um so anyway, that's what I believe. I believe that we will have angelic bodies. We, of course, will be under their rules and guidelines. I understand that. Um, but the opposite of that is when the devil promises, like he did with Eve, eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Ye shall be as gods. What's the 33rd word that the devil speaks? Ye shall be as gods. Gods is. Knowing good and evil. And so anyway, that's the devil's That's the devil's gospel that Paul told us that it was going to be delivered to us by way of um, an angel from heaven or a pastor that preaches or maybe a combination of both. Maybe while a pastor is preaching. And all of a sudden, he gets an anointing on him. They all get this anointing on them, right? Right before they come on stage, they get this anointing on them. They put on a big show. um, But anyway, they get this anointing on them. They tell everybody that they're going to be like gods, and they're going to have all the attributes of a god. Uh, Kenneth Copeland is still, he's still, teaching things like that. And he's wrong. He is preaching a false gospel. God said that they're going to be destroyed one of these days for doing that. So if you preach any other Jesus whom we have not preached, if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. And here's what's interesting. The word gospel. I'm going to say something, and I want you to pay close attention to what I'm going to say. The word gospel comes to us by way of Old English, which in its day is everybody paying attention. In its day, it was the word God spell. Now, don't, I'm not going to hit the dun-dun-dun button. I'm not going to hit that. I'm going to hit the hallelujah. Hallelujah. It literally came to us by way of this word, God spell. The word spell or uh, is related to the German word spiel. You know, like a salesman comes over, and, all right, give us your spiel. Tell us what you've got to tell us. The word spell And the word spelling 
you know, like in a spelling contest doesn't always have to do with an occult ceremony. It doesn't. What ha- what where that came from was the phrase remember what uh evangelion means good tidings so the word good was converted over time to the word god And the word tidings or words somehow got changed to the word spell. When we teach our children to write the correct letters to make words, we're teaching them what? Spelling. Now we're not teaching our children witchcraft. And I've heard, I've heard YouTube videos. I've watched some of them. Where they say, yeah, that's proof right there that all the churches are evil. Yeah, all the churches are evil. That's why I don't go to church anywhere. No, you don't go to church because you're evil. That's your problem. They teach the God spell. They put a spell on everybody that they want to be under their spell. That's why they call it that. Yeah. Oh, good grief. But that's where it came from. It came from the phrase, good words. Good words. I will Behold, I bring you good tidings. I bring you gut or got spiel. God spell to gospel. Okay? The, our, the way we end a phone conversation is how. If you're my son-in-law, Michael, you end, a, you end a conversation by going, eh, <laughs> okay? <laughs> he cracks me up. I listen to him talk. He'll be talking to somebody in Kenya. And of course, I don't understand Swahili anyway, and he's talking 90 miles an hour. Blah, 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 blah. And you can hear him winding down. He's going, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Click. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard him say goodbye, ever. The phrase goodbye comes from the phrase God be with ye. God be with ye. Goodbye. Uh, Anyway, uh, another gospel, another gospel, another gospel four times. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you. Um, But now after, this is all in Galatians. This is what fascinates me. Now after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Um... You observe days, months, times, and years. One, you you do four things here. One, two, three, four. And um, let's see here. Let me do something real quick. You uh, you you. It causes you when you get with the weak and beggarly elements: earth, air, fire, and water. You will always be observing days and months and times and years. Watch out. uh, Watch out for any. um, Any group. No matter what. What religion. No matter what denomination. No matter what. That says that you must. um, 
you must worship God in a certain way on a certain day uh, because then God is really super pleased at you and you just you have to do it on these days in this certain way or God just isn't as pleased with you as he is other people. And it's sort of like a works-based salvation. It, they just tell you, uh, you, you do this on this certain day, and God will like you more than he likes all those other people who don't do those things. And they boast about them. They always, always boast about what they do on days, months, times, and years. Always. Um, now, let me introduce to you Yoga the Bear. Okay? Yoga um, actually has four primary parts to its teachings. The Yoga Gospel is what I call it, has four primary volumes of works or books that explain everything that can be learned about yoga, everything that it is, everything that it evolve that it it involves, um, And, and when I, I, I don't understand how people who are educated Christians or so-called Christians, how they uh, educate themselves with Bible, they've been educated in doctrines of the scriptures, they have been, and this could be pastors, pastors' wives, how is it that they can fall for something like this? I remember back in the 80s. Yeah, that was back when we were old. We were young, sonny. Back in the old days, in the 80s, yeah. Boy George was really, he was really hot back then. Uh, there was there was teachings going around, and I I was working at a church in Bryan, Texas, for the summer, doing an internship. And the pastor's wife, who was a sweet lady, I loved her. Um, she was teaching these young people this thing that Tim LaHaye had come up with. I don't think he invented it. I think he grabbed it out of psychology and used it and he said that there were four types of of uh, personality traits like uh, you were a phlegmatic or you were a sanguine um, or I can't remember the other two but they had to do with the way you presented yourself to other people your character if you were if you were sort of an inward person or you were an outward person or whatever. And LaHaye was mixing that in with the gospel of Christ. Sort of, sort of like saying uh, the, the people who, who really can, can really get saved is easily would be the people who are the, uh, the, the phlegmatic or whatever. I can't remember what they were. So I'll tell you much how much I listened to it. But and then the people who are, who would be really good at bringing the gospel to other people are this type of character group. And again, there was four of them. And I'm like, where is that in the Bible? The Bible doesn't give us directions as to who can likely go out and have the biggest success in taking the gospel out from the church, out into the streets, to talk to people and teach them the way of the cross. The Bible says nothing about that. 
Bible says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them uh, whatsoever I've com- teach them to observe whatsoever I've commanded ye. Jesus said nothing about it. Paul said nothing about it. In fact, Paul said, Paul has planted the seed. Apollos has watered. God brings the increase. Says nothing about your character traits or anything like that. You can look that up online. Uh, Look up sanguine and phlegmatic. I think it's P-H-L-E-G. You know, like phlegm, you know, like you cough up phlegm or whatever. Uh, and you should be, and, and cross, cross, cross that with Tim LaHaye, and you're going to find that. That's really the first time I ever heard about Tim LaHaye, and he did all this before he wrote the uh, Left Behind series. But it basically, it, it sort of narrowed down preaching the gospel and who would get saved versus who wouldn't get saved. It narrowed it down to a science that could be figured out. That if you're preaching to someone who is a sanguine, chances are they're not going to get saved. Chances are they're not. You're probably just wasting your time. And that was sort of the way that that was that was pushed all the way back then. Now, by the way, have you ever seen one of these before? It's a stack of stones. Two, three, four, five. There's usually five there. They represent the four primary um, Uh, primary forces of earth, wind, fire, and water. And the fifth one on the top represents ether or spirit. Generally the same thing. Uh, Think of it like this. Um, Here is uh, your DNA, earth, air, fire, and water. Here's your DNA. And here is something from the ether that is being added uh, to the four parts of your DNA. Okay? And just to give you, and I'm going to run here in a little bit, but just to give you an idea of where this goes. This is called, this. it comes from this book, Components of Yoga. Approximately 2,000 years ago. Now, uh, folks, think about that. Bum, 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 bum. Approximately 2,000 years ago, the sage Patanjali described the eight limbs of yoga in his text, the Yoga Sutra. Eight limbs. Four arms, four legs. Um, These eight limbs, I think, are representative of the the fact that the beast is the eighth and is of the seven. Now, for a long time, I thought of that verse, and I thought, And I was thinking that it said, the beast, he is the eighth, and he is one of the seven. That's what I thought it said. But a guy challenged me on it. And I went, I'll be doggone. Sure enough. So anyway, it says, the Yoga Sutra, and these limbs serve as a practical guide to self-development. You are going to recreate yourself in a better image than what you are in now. 
You are going to do that to yourself. They outline specific lifestyle, hygiene, and detoxification regimens, as well as physical and psychological practices that can lead to integrated personal development. Now, don't get me wrong. This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. And by the way, that's in here, 1526, prayer and fasting. In fact, there is another Bible. It was one of the first translated Bibles ever. It was translated by a Gothic minister. Uh, he wore black clothes, had black fingernails, and black, anyway. Um, it was translated by a Gothic uh, minister by the name of Ulfilis. And Ulfilis was using the manuscripts that he had at the time. And in both places where all of the modern translations take out prayer and fasting, Uphelus, in the whatever Greek Bible he had, had them in there. So what did he do? He didn't, he didn't make a phone call to Rome and say, hey, I got a problem here. I, you got your, you know, the, the Latin Bible doesn't say anything about prayer and fasting, but this original Greek here does. What do I do? Should I just leave it out? No. He left it in. This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. And again, that's that's one of the missing uh, verses in most of your new Bibles, the modern translations, what we call them. Um, folks, hi history history is going to is going to tell us which Bible is right. God is going to use history. He's already done it with me. He will use history on you to convince you that you do, in fact, have the correct Bible. And I'm, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that you do. I am. I'm glad that just about anybody in this world can get a copy even if they can't get the printed version of the King James Bible they can download our software purebiblesearch.com it's free and they can download it to their computer shh And they can read the Bible as we have smuggled it into their country. They can read the Bible in English. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, I love it. Uh, thanks for letting me be with you today. You're the reason why we do what we do. For Brother Sterling. I just came from seeing him. Um, let me shut this down for a minute. Uh, I, I came over from seeing him this morning. He does seem to look better. Uh, I was pretty, pretty concerned Sunday um, that he wasn't going to make it. 
so um but he he does seem to have a lot more pep uh this morning and so i appreciate all the prayers uh that you have uh, sent our way especially for our family and just continue them and i'll keep on giving you updates as to um his status he's an incredible man we love him very much uh we want god's best for him and uh so you pray for him as well all right all right god bless you i love you we will see you tomorrow